I will be a little bit more practical, and uh, I'm here as a member uh, of this platform. Um, and Bergmann Strost is a clinical site in the BG network from the Deutsche Gesetzliche Unfallversicherung. So we have nine clinical sites. I will uh, try to introduce to the, our institutions working together in that project, then run through the projects we have executed, our future ideas, a little bit probably about the publication Tissue Engineering in Europe in 2008, and if there is time, let me, let me mention some regulatory requirements. So this is our hospital, the first hospital built for trauma in the area of mid-Germany. This old building, the, the, the trauma headquarters, so to say, started in 1897, and the new one, it's from 1997. Um, we have a lot of uh, departments, and uh, here I'm representing the neuroscience stuff, which is neurology, neurosurgery. I'm a neurosurgeon, I'm a spine surgeon, and the early habilitation. What we do, we do everything basically from the acute phase, collecting the patient from the accident area, bringing him to the hospital, doing having diagnosis, and then the first uh, for surgery, and then bring the patient to the integrative rehabilitation, meaning that our rehabilitation ends in the moment where the patient gets back to their working position, to their work directly. So therefore, the BG network basically spends a lot of money to bring back the patient really uh, to his normal life and to his normal work. So we have uh, acute around so have half thousand cases in 2010. So that means 150,000 patient days. Where well, this is come through, uh, have a lot of acute phases like these. Like you see that 400 helicopter landings. We have it's actually 1,200 people working for us, and we have around 60,000 patients we see in on the on the war, on the on the ambulance way. We have around 500 patients in shock in the shock area, and uh, we take 60% we take of our normal patients from the emergency. Uh, the neuroscience here, the Neurocenter collaborates with the Translational Center of Regenerative Medicine in Leipzig, and we work together since 2005. Um, they follow a gate three, a three gate system, so to say, starting with conceptual research, going into preclinical, and then clinical research. We have several areas, research areas, tissue engineering, regulatory molecules and delivery system, cell therapy, and imaging modeling and modeling and monitoring of regeneration. So the mission here is basically to support the interdisciplinary research in all fields in regenerative medicine and to translate conceptual research into the clinical practice. There's additional core units, quality management, myosurgery, and animal models, and computational microscopy. Uh, in the phase, in this granting phase, but basically this money is coming from the German uh, Forschungsministerium, so to say. We have about 40 translation awards. The annual budget is around 5 million euro. There's 120 employees on that site. And this is how the publication's development is. Basically, you see that over the time. We started in 2006. And you see this publication present in these several areas. So we have basically two EU projects where we participate. In addition, a couple of patents and one startup company coming out there. And we have already arrived in the clinical phase state. So we have here clinical study phase one, two for multiple sclerosis. We have a liver-based metabolic disease phase one, two study. And we have one in neurosurgery where we look at cranial nerve function <clears throat> during surgery, organizing a conference in Leipzig in the end, in, in the beginning of November. Now shortly, I will run through what we have done from, from our site in disc regeneration. 
So biological repair in the surgical field of disc and spine surgery, as you can see, is very, very low and only fits into the very first time of degeneration. And we came from the hypothesis that the, shit, the disc should be repairable when, and when we take a disc surgery and take disc material out, we should bring back something. Like here you see in the lower segment that there is a disc herniation in the MR. And if you look in detail into that, you can see this kind of cleft formation in the degeneration of the annulus. And then in magnifications, you see the widening and the loosening, basically, of the structure. How to deal with this? Basically, we started with canine trials, where we went to two sites, one with uh, only surgery and one with transplantation and surgery. And you see here the post-transplant result in comparison to the normal control after three months, in comparison to the no-cell treatment. You see the better the quite good result in the transplanted area, and after 12 months, you can see in this canine model that you can basically repair that disc in, in comparison to where you have only operated here on the left side. And we have tested that with collagen 2, and we have basically shown that this is a good collagen, collagen 2 formation in this area. We brought this early into the clinical application in a pilot series. All this is basically in the second step, a minimal invasive approach. So patient comes for surgery, you take out the material, this is a normal surgery, and then you cultivate the cells and carry them back, and this is only by a puncture, of course. There was a pilot study with 15 patients, and this is actually now the, you have seen the, the, the lesions coming up, and this is how the degenerated disc looks like. You see how these uh, fibers are very different. They are still, still trying to build exocellular matrix, as you can see here. When you take away the cell, you see the collagen 2 production around. So after the pilot study, we had a, we had a bigger trial with uh, 163 patients uh, running from 2002 to 2007. And you see when we compared, we had a, a part of the patients we only operated and the others were we transplanted in addition to the surgery. And you see for the evaluating, you have to, you have to use here scores in the, in the orthopedic field for disability and pain. And in all scores, you have a um, significant better results after transplantation. This is for different scores, the, the same thing, and also for the pain of the patients. Plus, we had approximately a 50% reduced reherniation rate in the cases we had to transplant, that is a lot because around 15% of patients get the reherniation of their disc after surgery. And here you can see it after transplantation. In some cases, you can really bring up the disc level again. And then we have patients we follow over now. It's up 10 years now, but this is five year follow up. So you can follow over a long time and follow basically the water content in the disc over time. We have stepped forward to bring that, or to try that same thing with mesenchymal stem cells from fat tissue. In the first series, again in a canine model, we started to look for, we have started the chondrocytes at this time in celine. Now we look for a better carrier material and we found out that to augment, yeah, supplement and to replace that, it is better to go with, which is a little bit more uh, jelly. And we have taken at this time um, hyaluronic acid to to bring this in with the cells. And we found out that in comparison to others, we tested that the hyaluronic acid is the best carrier material for our mesenchymal stem cells. We have proven this. We could find that it's at least safe. We step forward to a bigger series. Uh, we have done that, uh, and you see it here, in the comparison to the lowest L6, seven normal disc, you have the R, ADRCs in HA, 
and the AJ only above that, you see the much better result with the stem cells. We can basically compare this to no treatment here, like in the bony study, and you see you have a lot of degeneration in this field compared to the transplantation side, and here you can, feel, you can also see it, that basically that the stem cells in AJA giving a good result in the canine trial. And basically, we've shown that Agrican and uh, Collagen 2 came back to, not to normal, but to around 84% in the transplanted area. So at least safe, and uh, also there is a proof for efficiency for that. What comes now, what is the next step then? We bring that, uh, we step back in the moment a little bit because we go back to chondrocytes also with a better carrier material. We go, we have identified an albumin uh, and we will go with that again through a human trial, which is anti osteogen and anti androgen from the carrier material side. We have tested this biomechanically also to show even that after 100,000 cycles of loading, the material is not getting out of the disc. It's only in this area where we puncture. A little bit comes out, but basically it stays over time. There where you have placed it, and we have passed that through a big animal trial. And now we are coming up with this kind of end study, like we call it. Um, and we are starting basically now in January. Other projects around that, we have uh, in the TRM directly a, a, a project called NanoDisc, in the disc repair with other nanostructured injectable scaffolds loaded with adipose stem cells. We are thinking to uh, polypeptides and also to a, a couple of uh, new electro spinned uh, collagen materials. Uh, we, have, uh, we have a similar stuff running uh, on the European side, Nama Bio, where we basically bring our experience and try to find a way to work together with a couple of other groups. And we have basically the idea to bring now the stem cells into a clinical application together with the WMC in Amsterdam. Uh, and, uh, but there is still, let's say, the acceptance to get the liposuction first to get these kind of mesenchymal stem cells out from fat tissue in the patient world not yet so accepted and in the medical and doctor's world not even so good accepted that it is easier for us today to work with chondrocytes from the patients. This is only to mention we are working um, in the nano spinning on the let's say industrial scare and uh, found a very nice uh, Animal, the place note, S uh, uh, snake here, skate egg casing. They do, they put with, they have a kind of cross linker where they fix in their collagen their eggs in the beach. And this is what we have used for our fibers. And we can, we are basically able to cross link collagen here and make it stable and bring it into a bone void filler also in a textile when it will be woven. I'm basically through it. I wanted to show you that when you look in detail what happened in the year 2008, the, in Europe, the published numbers of uh, therapy is not high. It's 1,040 cases in Europe, where 36% is allogenic, 64 is autologous. And when you look here in detail what it is, it's 30% autologous, 100% from the cardiovascular side. Musculoskeletal is mainly autologous, and we are, we are below the 20%. And autoimmune disease is 12%. So you see that the entire amount, this is data published in 2010, about 2008, so we're waiting for the next step, will come out next year in spring to look into the numbers from 2010. From 2006 to 8, the numbers did not change so much. So I, I'm I'm wondering if this number really gets much higher than what it is here. And I know exactly that, that they are very precise because our number with 40 cases a year is in there. Some words about the regulatory, if I may. We organize from our network regenerate a kind of 
um, regulatory network where we looked at the current problems on the AT&P regulation in Europe. Um, there's a lot of requirements today, regulatory requirements after the big change for the somatic cell therapy products and the tissue engineering products and, of course, for the combination products. So when you combine cells with a medical device or with another material, you are regulated today under the ATMP regulation. And this is basically how the uh, Commission sees the combination products. The cell or tissue part must contain viable cells or tissues, or the cell part containing non-viable cells should have an action that can be considered as primary to that of the devices. So this is a formulation which is, gives a certain kind of flexibility, not, but not so very much, because and this is important to know for all further developments we have to we will, we will make. And this is what they have done so far. So this is actually for marketing authorization with this new regulation, which starts first, uh, basically starts the 31st of December 2012, so in a year from now. This is data from last year. There's only one approval in Europe through the, through the committee. And there is some contact, there is some, um, yeah, evaluations and, uh, so to say, traffic between EMA and companies. Um, but there's still 50 products in Europe uh, which are not fully regulated, and these people have to deliver data now to, to come to the next step of marketing authorization. This is how this legislation looks like. For us, the interesting is the ATMP 1349 from 2007. And this is how these committees look like. So there's a special cat committee called for advanced therapy. And uh, this is their task. They classify the ATMP and basically they assist you, but they also evaluate what you have done from the company side. And then they try to bring you to this marketing authorization. And there's a lot of things you have to think before about this is the dose finding for the material, for the marketing authorization application. You have to provide the proof of concept, the safety, and the efficacy, of course, and others, and there's factors you have, have in mind when you want to reach this kind of meaningful endpoints in homogeneous patient groups, valid surrogates market, and so on and so on. There's a long, long list what you have really to bring in to get marketing authorization for these cell products in Europe. And very often, and this is what we hear from industry today, industry says, okay, no, no, no individualized therapy, it's too expensive, probably for some cases good, but what we want from industry is more, let's say, from the shelf, allergenic, cheap, um, and we have to balance that because there is a lot of need for individualized targeted therapy for special diseases, for higher severeness of diseases, than only to speak about the bone, bone void filler you take in the R from the shelf, which should not cost more than two to 500 euro. Anyways, these may be regulated as medical devices, and you have mentioned that the medical device regulation will be changed soon, so basically is in the process of getting changed. So clinical data for this is needed as well. So there is a new balance needed, so to say, between ATMP and, and these uh, medical devices. And what the, what, the, what the EU here for the committee actually goes for is a kind of risk-based approach for all these ATMPs to reduce this huge amount of overwork and over-information so that they really concentrate on the risk. I have to acknowledge many people are working with me in between, of course, you also Paula Sanmi Kangas from, from the CAT group and people we are working to there in the US, in Leipzig, and from many companies helping us. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Meisel. And I was happy to see some uh, MRI uh, images that, uh, that helped your research. But maybe there's a question, or more question. Yeah, 